on Compete. I am practicing down in Puyallup, Washington at a ProLine Surgeons Group. Uh, it's turned out to be just an amazing practice for me. Uh, it, it's truly rewarding to be able to practice medicine the way I, I want and to have staff who are enthusiastic to come to work every day is, is a very nice surprise. So uh, we've been uh, pretty slow the last two months as y'all have. Um, now this last week or two, I've really started to pick up again and things are quite busy now. Um, now starting to do um, pretty elective surgery, not completely elective, but pretty close, um, certainly sinus surgery. So today, you know, I always like to talk with this group about the new technologies in my space in rhinology, mainly so that you're aware of it if patients come in asking for these types of interventions. Um, some of them are good, some not so good, and I am pretty uh, into the literature behind the devices. I never try something unless it looks promising. And then it's always, you have to try it yourself. And so I want to talk about this, this eustachian tube dysfunction issue and the balloon dilation of these eustachian tubes and where we stand with that. There's a new uh, kind of non-surgical procedure for nasal congestion, which is intriguing. Um, and I just started doing that a little bit and I'll chat with you about that. And then I want to give an update on nasal polyps. Um, obviously this is kind of the nemesis of my practice and our practice and the patients we share. Uh, but really over the last year or so, my philosophy of how to treat these patients long-term has changed. And it's a constant evolving um, philosophy based off of the technology we have. So we'll just get into it. Uh, I have a couple disclosures related to this. I am an educational consultant with Intersect ENT. They make this drug looting stent called Sinuva. Uh, it's the only drug looting stent, so I can't really use a non-brand name, um, but I'll try to say Mometazone Furate Releasing Stent. Uh, I am on the scientific advisory board for AstraZeneca, for nasal polyps, as well as for Optinose, and they make it Exhance. Let's start with balloon dilation of these station tubes. And we're gonna chat about what eustachian tube dysfunction is very briefly. We're gonna, hey, Bill, I can see you. <laughs> Bill's the only one I can see right now. That's nice to see you. Uh, who is a candidate for a balloon dilation of the eustachian tube? Does it work, which is very important. And then just briefly, very briefly about the technique, I'll show you a short video about it. There's a couple different flavors of eustachian tube dysfunction. The dilatory eustachian tube dysfunction is certainly the most common. Uh, Functional is the concerning one. Functional is related to an anatomic obstruction. And specifically what I want the allergists in this group to know is if a patient comes in, an adult patient with a unilateral middle ear effusion, so blockage of one side of the eustachian tube or the middle ear space, that patient needs to get an assessment by an ENT. Uh, and the reason is you know, if it's a global systemic problem, people should have bilateral eustachian tube dysfunction. When it's just one eustachian tube that's not working or the middle ear space that's full, that often will mean that there's some underlying process, a mass uh, either in the nasopharynx or in the eustachian tube itself. Uh, it's pretty easy to work those patients up. We get a CT scan and nasal endoscopy. And I'll show you one example of a unilateral uh, eustachian tube dysfunction patient. And then anatomic, that's uh, you know, that's the one uh, where the eustachian tube is just not functioning well. It does, it is a muscular cartilaginous uh, tunnel in the nasal cavity region and then a, a bony canal. And sometimes the muscles just don't work well. They don't open enough and people have constant eustachian tube dysfunction, which is quite annoying. Uh, the barrow induced this is kind of something near and dear to my heart. Uh, this is where people have eustachian tube dysfunction when pressure changes dramatically. So pilots, flight attendants, people who travel a lot on airplanes, and also scuba divers. These are the main people. They have completely normal hearing and normal eustachian tube function at sea level, but when they're challenged, that's when they get the eustachian tube dysfunction, and they can't clear their ears very well. Patchless eustachian tube dysfunction, this one's odd. Uh, this is where the eustachian tube is too open and patients will complain really two times. One, if they're using sinus irrigations or a neti pot, they'll get fluid up into their middle ear space. And that's not dangerous. It's, it's very annoying. It can cause some temporary dizziness just because of the rapid temperature change in the middle ear. Uh, 
but they also complain of echolalia, which is the sensation of hearing your own voice in an echo. And it's often attributed to dramatic weight loss. There's really no treatment for patulous eustachian tube dysfunction other than reassuring the patient. Um, and usually those patients I won't have do sinus irrigations. And then it's just defined as acute versus chronic based on three months or so. And then that's really important if we're considering a surgical intervention. Now, the duration of the dysfunction is important. The comorbidities, including allergic rhinitis, chronic rhinosinusitis, or LPR's laryngeal pharyngeal reflux disease. There was a really nice talk the other uh, day in this group about GERD. We tend to call it LPR because we focus on the larynx and the pharynx. And it's certainly been shown in kids that you can, uh, you can detect stomach acid contents in the middle ear space in kids as young as two years old. So it does impact that, that fragile tissue. What we do is take a look with a good otoscope and this is, this is using a auto microscope, which, you know, you look at this and it's like so easy to see what's going on compared to the handheld otoscope, which is very, very challenging. You know, I still think it's challenging to see any, uh, anything other than normal landmarks with the handheld otoscope. Uh, this patient had some otosclerosis down here. That's what the white stuff is. And there's a bit of an effusion in the background, but uh, this patient has chronic eustachian tube dysfunction. Nasal endoscopy is also important. This is looking in the left nostril. Uh, and I hope you can see, hey Bill, since you're the only one, can you see my cursor moving? Just nod your head. Yeah, great. Okay, so this is the nasal septum right here of the left side. This is the nasal floor. This is the inferior turbinate or posterior part of the inferior turbinate. And this mass that I started right here, that is a juvenile nasal angiofibroma. And this patient, about I think he was about 21, 22 years old, didn't present with epistaxis. He presented with uh, significant left-sided hearing loss and eustachian tube dysfunction because this big vascular mass was blocking his eustachian tube. So. That's why we take a look with an endoscope to make sure people don't have this. Uh, nasal pharyngeal carcinoma is another common thing that we can see, or just really big adenoid hypertrophy. We will often get a CT scan. This is a temporal bone CT scan. Usually I'll get a sinus CT scan, but I wanted to use this just to show, uh, it's kind of tipping my hat of what I'm gonna talk about. This is a cr internal carotid artery right here. And there's a little, you can see the bone here, and then there's an absence of bone, and that's a dehiscent internal carotid artery in the eustachian tube. The black is the eustachian tube right here. This is the mastoid on the patient's right side. And having a dehiscent internal carotid inherently is not a bad thing. Uh, sometimes these patients will hear pulsatile tinnitus, but if you're considering balloon dilation, this is a contraindication. This is a typical uh, uh, abnormal tympanogram. You see uh, the peak is in the negative pressure zone. So this is a uh, retracted eardrum and it's not, it's not uh, working very well. This patient's gonna have a type of conductive hearing loss. We want the peak to be over zero. And a tympanogram is important in these patients, uh, but it's not always abnormal. And, and that can be a challenge, especially with the barrow-induced eustachian tube dysfunction, because at sea level, these people who have barrow-induced eustachian tube dysfunction have completely normal tympanograms. And that's why it can be kind of a hard sell to the insurance company to s just because we don't have any objective evidence other than the patient's subjective response. Speaking of subjective responses, this is the Eustachian Tube Dysfunction Questionnaire-7. So seven questions that ask about uh, the Eustachian Tube Dysfunction. And if you're interested at all, you can email me and I'm happy to send you uh, this questionnaire you can give your patients. Um, I use it on any patient that has Eustachian Tube Dysfunction that I'm considering doing an intervention. Uh, it's a well-validated instrument and it does respond to change pretty nicely. The classic medical therapy for eustachian tube dysfunction includes uh, decongestants, so pseudoephedrine or phenylephedrine. Um, I, when I go on a scuba diving trip, I always take pseudoephed with me and I take afrin and that's a whole nother issue about whether or not you're supposed to use these medications when you're diving, but you know, you spend a lot of money and go on a dive trip, you kind of want to dive. Uh, 
allergy management is absolutely critical for uh, for bilateral eustachian tube dysfunction if they have it, including the nasal steroids in and of themselves. They don't work great. Adding the antihistamines or immunotherapy helps. Proton pump inhibitors uh, or other medications for GERD are important if they have it. And frequent Valsalvas, you know, I'll spend sometimes five minutes teaching a patient in clinic how to Valsalva, pinch the nose and, and blow and try to open up those eustachian tubes. And you can have your patients do it about six times an hour is what we recommend, which means they'll think about it, every, you know, maybe twice a day. Uh, some people will set their uh, phone on alarm, but by doing frequent Valsalvas, it equalizes the pressure in the middle ear. And it's important because when you have a negative pressure within the middle ear, it will draw in the surrounding free fluids of the tissue. And that's what causes the middle ear effusion. It's not a, you know, rarely is it an infection. It's just a sterile effusion. So by equalizing the pressure, that'll help decrease the, the pulling of that fluid. And we recommend the medical therapy for four weeks before thinking about doing something else. I'll have the patient come back and if they're still having significant symptoms, consider um, continued medical management, pressure equalization tubes, which can be done either in the office, uh, if the patient's tolerant, uh, fairly easy to do, or it can be done in the operating room under uh, quick anesthesia, uh, usually just conscious sedation. And balloon dilation of the eustachian tube is the newest player on the block. So let's talk about that. Uh, this is a pressure equalization tube. It's small. So this is only about three millimeters in diameter and, and the internal lumen's about a millimeter. And the challenge with these, there's, there's several. Uh, if the middle ear fusion is fluid, clear fluid, then it's pretty easy for that to drain out uh, and equalize the pressure. If it's thick kind of glue, we call it glue ear, uh, it just doesn't drain out of that tube very well. Uh, the other problem with PETs is that you can't, you know, there's a controversy whether or not you should swim. Uh, most people say it's fine to swim in a chlorinated pool, but not so much in, in salt water or lake water. And certainly if you're a scuba diver, you cannot have a pressure equalization tube. So that's a, that's a super contraindication to dive. Uh, this is me in Roatan and uh, it's, it's important. I, I do see a lot of divers, some professional divers who have eustachian tube dysfunction and balloon dilation is a good possibility for them. Um, other problems with the equalization tubes is you can have a chronic perforation. So, you know, we are putting a hole in the tympanic membrane and then a tube. And usually a tube like this, this little guy will fall out after four to six months. There are other types of tubes called T-tubes that will last for up to a couple of years before the eardrum kicks it out. Sometimes that hole just doesn't close and then you have a perforation that has to be fixed. Um, and then uh, you can also, you know, again, these tubes, they're so small, they can get crusted up, they can block up. And so sometimes they don't work great, but this is, I believe it's still the most common procedure, surgical procedure done in America. So it works well. Uh, so indications for balloon dilation of the eustachian tube uh, ear fullness or oral fullness greater than 12 weeks. The uh, current indications are a type B or C tympanogram. So that means either a very stiff uh, eardrum or a retracted eardrum. A type A tympanogram is a normal uh, tympanogram. And that's, again, the challenge with these barrow-induced eustachian tube dysfunctions. These are people who really benefit the most from this procedure. Uh, but it can be a little challenging to get insurance companies to cover it. The eustachian tube dysfunction questionnaire, uh, they have to have a score greater than two and they need a failed medical management, including the Valsalva maneuver, uh, as well as uh, a type of steroids, either four weeks of nasal steroids or one week of oral steroids. And our academy issued this consensus statement. They kind of did it because there was they were getting a fair amount of pushback from the payers um, and they wanted to clarify some things. So on occasion, people will do a myringotomy. So put a um, incision in the eardrum and suck out the fluid uh, and sometimes put a tube in at the same time of doing balloon dilation of the eustachian tubes. You don't have to, but if a patient has a middle ear effusion, this will help them recover faster. As I mentioned earlier, a dehiscent carotid is a 
strong contraindication. As far as I know, nobody has had any carotid injury with eustachian tube uh, balloon dilation yet. And patient with, as I said, middle ear fusion uh, should probably get a myringotomy, which is the uh, placement of the tube. Always need to do a nasal endoscopy uh, with eustachian tube dysfunction, especially unilateral. Uh, but if we're considering balloon dilation, this is why you do the nasal endoscopy, because if a patient has a really deviated septum, you just can't get the access and you'd have to do a septoplasty and straighten out the septum ahead of time. There's uh, a couple decent research studies. There was one uh, that looked at patients out to six weeks and then another one that I attached um, to this talk that went out to, I believe, 52 weeks. Uh, Originally, the indications were for patients 22 years and older. Now it's down to 18 years and older. And the inclusion criteria, patients had to fail the medical management, which was defined as four weeks of nasal steroids. They had to have the eustachian tube dysfunction questionnaire being abnormal. That's a subjective measure. And then had to have an abnormal tympanogram, so not barrow-induced eustachian tube dysfunction. And these patients were randomized to uh, balloon dilation, uh, with medical management or just medical management alone. And the primary outcome was normalization of the tympanogram, which is kind of a lofty primary outcome measure. Uh, the, probably the subjective outcome measure might have been better, but they were um, uh, they wanted to find that objective measure. And what they found was, you know, in about 50% of people at six weeks, they had normalization of the tympanogram. And of the station tube dysfunction questionnaire, again, about 50%. So, when you look at it out to 52 weeks, and VJ Anand's paper is the one I, I think I included, uh, this, the, uh, it continued about 50-50. And that's what I tell my patients. With balloon dilation of the eustachian tube, you have about a 50-50 chance of having normalization of your eustachian tube function. And you know, getting to normal is great. Getting better than when you were is pretty good. So this doesn't measure getting better than where they didn't report at least the results of getting better. They just reported getting normal. So a lot of my patients or some will say, well, it's not completely perfect, but it's a lot better than where it was. And of the three or four commercial divers that I've done this on, they've all been a, a lot better and they've all been able to resume uh, commercial diving one week after surgery. Um, for recreational scuba divers, I tell them six months after, after surgery, but that's just uh, for safety issues. We can do this procedure in the operating room under a general anesthesia or conscious sedation, or it can be done in the office. And uh, it's under either local anesthesia or general. And the reason I starred local is there's a definite art form to appropriately numbing up the nose to do in-office procedures. and for me, when I'm doing it, it doesn't matter if I'm doing balloon dilation of the station tube or the sinuses or cryotherapy or radiofrequency, it takes a solid 20, 25 minutes to numb up the nose. The main reason is lidocaine takes a while to work. And it drives me absolutely insane when I hear about surgeons who just do an injection and they go in and they, they do the procedure right away. So I rarely use injections now. I will just spray with Afrin and lidocaine spray with COVID, we're no longer using an atomizer, we're using just a single use mister. And then uh, with our, the compounding pharmacy that I use, uh, they have this amazing lidocaine version that it, at uh, refrigerator temperature, it's liquid. And then as soon as you kind of squirt it in the nose and it hits body temperature, it turns into a gel. And so it sits right where you want that lidocaine to work. And it'll just sit there for you know 10 minutes and then I'll suction it out and the patient is completely numb. I can almost do whatever I want in the nose uh, without them feeling it. So that's kind of the trick and that's why it's starred. Uh, if you hear horror stories about patients having nose procedures in clinic, uh, you know, consider talking to your ENT about other <coughs> anesthesia options. But again, it takes time and you just have to be patient. That's, that's sometimes surgeons are impatient as you probably know. Uh, the equipment, you need an endoscope and a video tower. Uh, this is my old medical assistant. Uh, and then there are two types of eustachian tube balloons right now on the market. I blocked out their name brands uh, for CME purposes. 
And this is kind of what it looks like. Here's the nasal cavity down here. This is obviously the station tube. This is the cartilaginous portion and then the bony portion up here. Here's the middle ear space. These are the ossicles and here's the tympanic membrane eardrum and the external auditory canal. And it's, it's super, super easy to do. Under endoscopic visualization, you just put the balloon in and then you dilate it. And what it does is it creates these fractures of the cartilage uh, part of the eustachian tube, and that's what stays open in, again, slightly over 50% of patients. This is a video that shows uh, it on the left side, and all the little blood vessels that you see, that's completely normal. This is sliding the uh, balloon in, and it has a very atraumatic tip, like you cannot puncture an egg yolk with the, the tip of this balloon, and the whole point of that is not to puncture the internal carotid artery when you dilate it. So it's going right at the torus tabarius, that's inflating it, and you leave it inflated for two minutes. I wasn't gonna sit here for two minutes with you guys. Uh, so that's deflating it and then retracting the balloon. And you can see there, it looks pretty much the same, um, but it fractures that cartilage. And, uh, and then I'll see the patient back usually two weeks later. And at two weeks, they're, they're some are doing, the, the ones that get a lot of relief, they're feeling better, uh, but it does take, seems to be about a month until the inflammation of the eustachian tube calms down. The biggest challenge right now is balloon dilation of the eustachian tube does not have a CPT code. So it doesn't have a procedure code, and which means it's hard to get paid to do it. Uh, and the balloon itself costs about $1,200. Fortunately, in January, 2021, there is gonna be a brand new code and you're gonna see, a, I'm sure you'll see a spike in this procedure amongst ENTs. Um, right now there's a couple, it's called unlisted code. So you can say you're doing something to the middle ear space. Um, and sometimes we'll just say we're doing a myringotomy, just putting a tube in the middle, uh, in the eardrum and we'll put a tube in and then not charge for the station tube dilation. Uh, so that's the biggest challenge. But again, it, it's something that if, uh, if you don't want a pressure equalization tube, uh, this is a, really the only option if medical management isn't working. Any questions about eustachian tube dilation before we go on to nasal congestion? All right, and I don't have the chat box open, so you'll have to unmute your mic and just um, chat out loud. All right. Um, I blanked out the name brand of this as well. Uh, this is about in-office uh, procedure for nasal congestion. There's, there's been, uh, in the past, I'm sure you've heard about radio frequency ablation of the inferior turbinates. And this is not that procedure. Radio frequency of the inferior turbinates, to me, you get out what you put in and it doesn't work that good. It's, you know, the RF ablation of the inferior turbinate traditionally is you basically stick like a, it's a solid needle and then apply the RF energy and it very, very gently cooks the inside of the turbinate. It's a super easy procedure to do in clinic. Maybe 20 to 30 percent of people feel benefit from it. I don't do it that way anymore because it just doesn't work well. I'll do a in-office turbinate reduction, gentle turbinate reduction. Um, using coblation, which is a slightly different plasma technology. But now that this thing came out, I've done it just a couple times. Uh, and it's, it's easy to do, and there's some good research to, sh to back it up. So this is, I consider this, if a patient has a relatively straight septum, and they don't have giant turbinates, if they have a deviated septum and giant turbinates, I'm going to take them to the operating room and do a septoplasty and, and gentle turbinate reduction. Uh, for these patients who come in, they have a stuffy nose and it's kind of just congested. You know, you look in there and it's just tight. Um, this addresses the head of the inferior turbinate, uh, the septal swell body, which is something that we've never even really considered doing anything about. So the septal swell body, uh, the septum it is, it's not entirely straight vertical up and down. It does have this hourglass shape at about the two thirds up is this swollen area of the septum and that's the septal swell body and it's just soft tissue it's not cartilage 
Uh, it's soft tissue over the cartilage. We don't know what it's there for. Uh, there's no fancy cells inside it, but it does cause congestion. And really, this is the only way we address it. Uh, and, and then the internal nasal valve. So this area is the internal nasal valve. When you um, see people breathe in and their nose collapses, like, like mine collapses right here, and a lot of Caucasian noses have weak cartilage, uh, this will help stiffen up that area. Uh, it's the lateral crura of the lower lateral cartilage. That's what's right underneath this tissue. And the treatment is, so first of all, you, you just anesthetize the nose. Again, it takes about 20 minutes to numb it up the right way so that a patient doesn't feel hardly anything if it's done right. Uh, this procedure does require an injection of local and you kind of have to plump up the tissue for the RF energy to get absorbed. Uh, there's six sites. Uh, so the septal swell body, you do a couple sites, the inferior turbinate head, you do a couple sites, and then that nasal valve, you do two sites, 30 seconds each. And so it's a six minute procedure, but again, that's after 20 minutes of numbing it up. And most common adverse event is crusting. Uh, about 30 to 40% of patients will complain of crusting. So I just send them home using Aquaphor, which is a nice hand lotion. They just rub it inside the, their nose for uh, twice a day for a month. And that really cuts down on any crusting. It's not a painful procedure. Um, this, this is the validation study. And they use the nose questionnaire, which is a fantastic instrument. Um, if you don't have the questionnaire, I'm happy to send it to you. This get all my nasal congestion patients uh, get this subjective questionnaire. It's only five uh, items, but it has been very well validated. Uh, and this is the response. So um, higher is worse. So patients in this study had a very high congestion score. So 80 is awful. Uh, and by four weeks out, you can see it significantly dropped to half of where it was, and then that persisted out to half a year. Um, for an in-office procedure that doesn't require a general anesthesia and there's no cutting involved, this is a really strong response. The only critique is that there was not a control arm, so patients did not have the option of medical management to be in this study, and there hasn't been a comparative study yet. But I think we all pretty much know that when you have patients with really stuffy noses in, if you tell them to use nasal steroids and nasal antihistamines, you know, they, some of them get a huge response if they're very allergic, but uh, the non-allergics um, don't have this type of robust response. The average pain level was uh, about a 30 out of 100 on a visual analog scale, so that's still pretty mild. I'll have patients take Tylenol one hour before surgery and they drive themselves home after the procedure. Um, and usually they take the day off, but they're back to work the next day. This, um, I'm gonna backtrack one slide. So this, you may hear about the RF device and it can also be used for post-nasal drainage there's a different hand piece that goes further back to get the posterior nasal nerve, which is the uh, postganglionic parasympathetics that supply the uh, mainly the mucous glands of the nose. So this can be used for not only nasal congestion, but it's been validated for postnasal drainage. And it's different from the cryotherapy that I spoke to this group about last year. And this is where you put the little uh, balloon that you open up nitrous oxide and it freezes the tissue at the posterior nasal nerve. Um, I'm still doing this more than the radio frequency. I'm not, um, I like the idea of using cold uh, back in this space because there is a branch of the internal maxillary artery uh, that runs right next to this space. And the thought is that the heat from the blood flowing through the artery protects the wall of the artery. As far as I know, there hasn't been an injury of that artery with the radio frequency device. Uh, I just think it's more, um, th there's potential for that compared to cryotherapy. And until I see a nice animal study showing that it doesn't injure the lumen of the uh, posterior septal artery, um, I'm gonna stick with cryotherapy for now. Any questions on that before we move on to nasal polyps? Gives me a chance to drink my water. Okay, so this 
should take about another 10 minutes and then um, we can have some discussion um, about these things. So here's my typical patient. Uh, you look in the nose, this is the right nasal cavity. Here's the inferior turbinate on the right side. And this is this thing that looks like a peeled grape is a huge polyp. Here's the nasal septum. And you get a CT scan on these patients for a couple reasons. Make sure there's no bone erosion because sometimes there will be a more sinister mass that's hiding behind the polyps. Uh, inverting papillomas, exophytic papillomas, science cancer, things like that. So you always want to get a CT and make sure there's no bone erosion. And it's also uh, for pre-surgical planning. And I'll say it now, if you are going to get a sinus CT scan, please, please, please get a CT max face, maxillofacial CT scan. It's the same amount of radiation. It just um, will scan it and in a, a, in, it'll save more images. So a screening seat, sinus CT scan just saves about 40 to 50 images versus a CT max face will save about 200 images. We need that CT max face to use image guidance. And what's unfortunate is if a patient comes in with a screening sinus CT scan and then they're gonna need surgery, then I have to repeat a CT scan to use image guidance, which is pretty much most patients if they have, definitely patients with polyps or if we're doing frontal or sphenoid sinus surgery, uh, almost everybody now uses image guidance. Uh, so if you have to repeat the CT scan, now they're getting a double dose of radiation. And that's why I recommend if you're going to get a scan, get the right one up front. It'll significantly um, make the ENTs happier. It also will give you, uh, it'll usually scan the axial plane, but it'll give you the coronal and sagittal reformats, which are uh, crucial just to understand the, the complex anatomy and the frontal sinus. So that's the baseline. And as you know, this is what surgery looks like. This is looking in the left nasal cavity. This uh, instrument I'm using is a micro debrider. That's kind of our workhorse instrument and it sucks um, the polyps in and there's a splinting, spinning blade that cuts out the polyps. And you can see there. And it's funny because as I, as I do this more and more, uh, this is kind of what I feel like. Yeah, <laughs> I really feel like I am just mowing the lawn and it occurred to me one day, I wasn't mowing the lawn, but I was doing sinus surgery and, and really thought about, so why are we taking out these polyps? We know if we don't do anything after taking out the polyps, we know they're gonna grow back. There's at least 80 plus percent chance they're gonna grow back. And the whole point of doing polyp surgery is to allow facilitation of topical delivery of steroids. It is nearly identical to the asthma model. If a patient holds their breath or doesn't use their inhaler right and doesn't get the corticosteroids into their lungs, they're gonna have asthma exacerbations. Uh, if the steroids that you put in your nose can't get into the sinus tissue because of the polyps, it's not gonna work. It's gonna go down the nasopharynx and they're gonna uh, spit it out. So that's why we do polyps, simply to facilitate delivery of topical therapies. Uh, and if we do it right, this is the end result. This is the same patient, and that was the right side. This is the left side, sphenoid, maxillary, ethmoids, frontal sinus up here. This patient's on chronic bedesonide irrigations. Um, I've spoken about bedesonide before. It is almost standard of care now after sinus surgery, and it's simply adding bedesonide or pulmicort to the saline irrigation bottle, high volume irrigation, and irrigating once to twice a day. Um, again, it's completely analogous to using an asthmatic using an inhaler. Um, it does not have any significant systemic absorption, doesn't change intraocular pressures, doesn't change serum glucose or the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So it's super safe. Patients are irrigating anyway, and they might as well add bedesonide to it. Um, I use bedesonide irrigations not only on every polyp patient, but now every single sinus surgery patient I operate on, I'm using pedestinide for one or two months. It just helps them heal a lot faster. Um, and the reason for that over a steroid spray is the steroids just don't penetrate into the nasal cavity far enough. There are some other options that we'll talk about, um, but um, still, I don't think pedestinide irrigations are going far. And now with the compounding pharmacies uh, delivering the pedestinide, if insurance doesn't cover it, which is about at least a third of patients insurance won't cover it, 
um, the cash price is somewhere between 40 and $50 if you're using the right compounding pharmacy. And so you go from that ugly baseline to this post-op. Now, yes, this is an ideal result. Uh, there's probably a little cell right there. I should have got a little periorbital cell. Uh, and not, certainly not everybody heals like this. And we all know the, the problem patients who come back. Um, and this is where my philosophy has, has really changed. Um, it's, it's absolutely critical to do whatever we can to control the underlying inflammation. And if it's allergies, absolutely control the allergies. Um, we have to see these patients frequently and you'll understand why in a moment on the next slide. The reason is we need to intervene sooner than we have been intervening in the past. And I'll tell you why in a second. Um, those interventions, you know, nasal steroid sprays or systemic corticosteroids, um, as I mentioned, they're not ideal. The nasal steroid sprays are better than nothing. And um, some patients won't tolerate steroid irrigations or they can't afford it. And certainly um, topical nasal steroid sprays uh, are great for those patients or if they're traveling. One or two courses of prednisone a year, not too bad to beat down the polyps uh, to again, help facilitate budesonide irrigations. But if you think of these patients as asthma patients who need daily topical steroid deliveries, that will help um, the patients understand this philosophy. Exhance, again, I apologize for the name brand. There's no other way to say it other than it's really, really expensive fluticasone and it's delivered by this little I'm sure you, I know you guys know this, um, where you put one tube in your mouth and the other tube goes up your nostril and you blow and it puffs up the fluticasone further up into the nasal cavity. Uh, the research behind it is promising. It, it's something that I use if patients don't tolerate the desinide irrigations um, or if they want to just try something different. The Mometazone Furate eluding three-month sinus implant is a nice option. It's super easy to put in the office, uh, you need an endoscope and it does release mometazone for three months right in the ethmoid cavity. It works well when the polyps are relatively small. If the polyps are big, and I'll, I'm gonna show you an example uh, of big polyps, uh, it, it's just asking too much and those polyps need to be removed. And then biologic, certainly with Dupixent, you know, ENTs are getting a little bit more excited about Dupixent, but um, certainly if the patient has asthma uh, the biologics are a nice option, but it's just an expensive option uh, for sure. Um, and I think, you know, for patients who don't have asthma, uh, putting patients on an expensive biologic is, a, is kind of a hard sell for me uh, just to treat a stuffy nose. Uh, but if they have horrible asthma and you're keeping them out of the emergency rooms and out of the ICU, then it's definitely worth it. So this is how I think of polyps now. There's um, a grading scale from four is they're almost coming out of the nose. Three is they're huge. Two is they're confined to the middle meatus, which is essentially the space lateral to the middle turbinate. And then one is they're nice, small, cute polyps. And the green line, this is the trajectory I see with polyps. You know, they, they, they're zero, maybe after surgery. And then they start to grow and grow and grow and they keep growing. You never see them, you know, once they get here, you never see it spontaneously drop off and get miraculously better. They just continue to get worse. Uh, here's an example of a grade one polyp. That's the middle turbinate. This is on the left side. So this is in the middle meatus. That's the little polyp. A grade two is now they're starting to fill the middle meatus and the patients really complaining of no complaints over here, complaining here of, uh, olfactory loss and some increased nasal congestion and drainage. Grade three is now they're hanging below the middle turbinate and they're really obstructing the nose and causing some facial pressure. And then grade four is they're just enormous. Um, you look in the nose with your speculum and, and these are the ones you can see with your speculum. This is the golden opportunity when they're grade one, grade two. At this point, if we do an intervention, we can beat them back um, and keep them from progressing to grade three and four. But it requires close follow-up to see this because here the patients, as I said, they're not very symptomatic. And this is where I think in you know the last couple of years I've changed, but the previous 10 years, this is where I know I have failed, especially in a busy tertiary practice at the university where time is limited. Um, 
you know, I, I wouldn't see the patients back for appropriate follow-up. Just, there just wasn't time. And you would wait until the patients became symptomatic. And this is where they're symptomatic. And when they get this big, you have to do surgery to beat them down. You know, very few people respond to systemic prednisone when they're this big. Um, down here in this golden opportunity, this is where we can do things, either a prednisone burst or Sinuva, the implant or Exhance, something like that um, can shrink these polyps down. But again, when it gets to grade three and grade four, that's when we're stuck doing surgery. So this is how I think about it now. And I, I think about it in, you have to intervene before the patient's very symptomatic. So how do you know? If you don't have an endoscope, how do you know when you need, need to intervene? Well, talk to them about smell function. That's one of the first things to go if the polyps are growing back. Um, the second thing is usually uh, nasal drainage, either out the front or down the back. And that's the early, those are the relative early signs to intervene. Um, if they start to get nasal congestion, you know they're going to have usually grade three polyps or worse. And then once they get facial fullness and, and sinus pressure, um, they're going to be packed with polyps and the sinuses will all be backed up. So these are the times to intervene, decreased smell function and increased rhinorrhea. Uh, so the summary of my not so new treatment strategy, treat them when they're small, when they're asymptomatic. It doesn't mean surgery. It, it usually will mean a medical intervention or a, um, an in-office uh, polypectomy is an option. You numb up the nose for 20 minutes. I can use that little micro debrider and remove the polyps. It's not really doing sinus surgery. It's just removing the polyps. So that's not a good option if someone has not had sinus surgery. Um, sinus surgery, which I didn't mention before, there's a lot of different versions of it. There's poke little tiny holes in the sinuses, and then there's complete sinus surgery, top to bottom, side to side. And if patients have bad polyps, they need complete sinus surgery. The number one reason for revision sinus surgery is incomplete surgery. Um, and, you know, I don't do ear surgery. I don't do throat surgery. I just do nose sinus surgery, and I'm comfortable doing it. And I appreciate the general ENTs who do everything. And um, many general ENTs aren't comfortable completely opening up the sinuses, opening up the cells along the skull base or the frontal sinus or the cells along the orbit. Um, those have theoretical higher risks of injury, um, but that's what's needed in these polyp patients. Uh, and I'm seeing more and more generally ENTs refer those uh, patients out to rhinologists. Um, I do use the implant early or I consider the, the uh, Exhance in patients who don't tolerate in-office procedures. And then when all else fails, or if they have bad asthma, um, I uh, will recommend they talk to their allergist about biologics. Uh, before I forget, the word of the day is nasal. Uh, I don't know what kind of animal this is, but it's a pretty cool picture off of Google image. And uh, it's been a nice change into private practice. This is Puyallup. It's not that far away. Um, a lot of my patients, even those up north, are coming down to see me, which I really appreciate. I always tell them we have free parking right outside our office, <laughs> which is nicer than driving into Seattle UW traffic. Um, I'm happy to send you referral forms if you want. Just go ahead and email me uh, and happy to answer any questions. And I wanted to leave 15 minutes for questions. So here we are. If we don't have any questions, we can get about our day, but I'll open it up to you guys. Uh, Greg, this is Len. That uh, Sinova mometasone releasing stent, you sort of suggested you could put that in without surgery. I always thought first you removed the polyps and then you inserted it. So thanks for the question. You, the patient has to have had prior ethmoid sinus surgery. That's a strong requirement because you have to have the space for the implant to go. The implant's about an inch long, uh, seven millimeters wide. And, and so uh, a surgically naive patient, there's no space for that. If a patient has already had sinus surgery and the polyps came back, you can just push that implant right through those polyps and it'll spring open and it will shrink those polyps. And that's what all the validation studies, uh, Bob Kern, uh, did the main validation study 
for uh, that implant and I attached that uh, paper as well. Um, that's what they did. They did not do polypectomies first. Now, a lot of us will do a polypectomy if they're too big, um, because if, if, if the polyps are just huge, then you really need to kind of mow them down so that you can get the implant back where it needs to go. But no, you don't have to do polyp surgery at the same time as placing the implant. Um, it's, you know, some surgeons will do a polypectomy at the same time. Again, I think it's can be good for the patient, but it also has a procedure code with it if you do the polypectomy. Um, unfortunately, the Sinuva does not have a procedure code with it. There's a J code, so sometimes you get reimbursed for using it, but it's a you know $1,000 implant that doesn't necessarily get reimbursed um, by all the payers. So there's, and it takes extra time to do it. So there's some hesitation on the surgeons to use it. Um, I do think it's good for the patient, so. I have another question. Occasionally you see a patient who had a polypectomy and didn't have a recurrence for, for, you know, we think almost universally they recur and they recur quickly. Once in a while you see someone who said, I had it 10 years ago and I'm good. What do you think is going on there? Wish I knew. Um, yeah, I'm assuming, I'm assuming the patient you're talking about is not doing aggressive medical therapy. Uh, you know, I, I like to think if all of our polyp patients are controlling their allergies, are on uh, monolucast, are using bedesonide irrigations, they're doing pretty well. Um, but I agree. Sometimes you take out the polyps and they don't come back. Uh, you know, we used to think 10 years ago, we used to think all inflammatory sinus disease was related to infection. And that's why we would use so much antibiotics more than steroids 10, 15 years ago. And, and now it's kind of the opposite, but maybe in those patients that the polyps don't come back, maybe it truly was an in infection that was driving the inflammatory response and, and you removed it. Um, I don't think I've ever seen it, or rare, I'll say rarely seen a patient with asthma and nasal polyps when you remove the polyps and the polyps and asthma go away. Uh, yeah, I, I, that would be beyond my expectations. Greg, I see on your sign it says, this is Mary Lasley, your nose, throat, and allergy associates. So are you associated with allergists or are you guys doing anti-allergy? <laughs> Hi, Mary. Nice to, nice to hear you. <laughs> Sorry, nice um, to hear you. Yeah, so this, this ENT group does do allergy. Um, they do the ENT version of allergy. Um, I, you know, you're, it, it's interesting because, um, you know, it, but it's, it's a truly environmental allergy. If anybody has asthma, it's that, that I work with three other docs here, nobody's into that. And so um, there's um, a couple allergists in the Puyallup area that, um, that we'll send patients to, uh, but they're doing it. We're doing immunotherapy here. Um, I've learned a valuable lesson. <laughs> uh, every time an allergist sends me a patient in Epic using the sticky note, I'll always put referred by allergist so-and-so. Um, and so I don't inadvertently send that patient to a different allergist for biologics, which I did once before at the UW and I apologize for that. Um, uh, or accidentally, um, you know, take over their allergy uh, therapy. So that's that's definitely not something that I want to do, and won't ever do. I wish we had an allergist here, though. Anybody want to come down? Pyop's a nice place. Cost of living's a lot better. Uh, but no, we don't have medicine allergy at our practice right now. Greg. Um even though um, you're, well, if people still need to go to the university to have the procedures that you described, are they available there as well? I, so I am not, no, people don't need to go to the university um, for these procedures. This is bread and butter, well, my version of bread and butter sinus surgery. And we, I operate out of our surgery center, which is in this building and also at Good Samaritan Hospital. Um, you know, it, it's, it's amazing to have the perspective and recognizing this is being recorded and who knows who's watching, but it's amazing to see the difference between a tertiary medical center 
uh, a community-based hospital, and then a surgery center. And there's advantages and disadvantages to every model. Uh, one of the advantages in the surgery center is a patient who comes in for surgery, especially with COVID around, they interact with a total of six people, including the receptionist and me. Um, and it's handpicked people, it's handpicked anesthesiologists. Um, there are no trainees here. And it's a very um, efficient, thorough, safe way to do surgery. So we're doing full, the only type of surgery I'm not doing here are really aggressive sinus uh, cancer surgeries or skull base surgeries. We'll have a big audience. Any other questions from outside? Well, Greg, thanks for rejoining our group taking an hour of your morning uh, for an excellent presentation. My pleasure. I, yeah, I've enjoyed the last couple of weeks and it's nice to, um, nice to have this match up with my schedule too. So I uh, hope you don't mind me joining your group, but thank you for uh, allowing me to appreciate it. Uh, we're happy to have you. I was very happy when you uh, contacted me the other day and get you back on the schedule. And I think Ian is going to do a talk in June for us as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah, you'll enjoy Ian. I think he's spoken to your group before, Ian Humphreys. He uh, yeah. was one of my junior partners at the UW. So yeah, he's a good guy. Hey, Bill, how come you're the only one I can see other than Greg? The rest of us are all... I don't know you're hear muted. You, but, uh, Everybody see, else are in their pajamas. I see you. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, congratulations on being a grandfather, Len. That's exciting news. Uh, thank you. It was a long labor. My wife was uh, up most of the night pacing the floor, worrying what was going on. All right, everybody, so long. Have a great day, everybody. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Greg. Thank you.